couple of minutes left before we start um, our next talk by Vanessa Muller. Um, some people ask me what these QR codes on your name tags are for. They do not work. Apparently, I haven't figured that out. If you just scan them with your camera, but we have an Bitcom Events app. So if you download that, you'll have an option to use your camera, and then you'll get the profile of the people you're talking to. So if you want to connect, and if you don't want to type in your name in, name in LinkedIn or any other platform, feel free to use that, because that's um, the reason why we added these QR codes to your name tags. So feel free to connect with your peers. And also, uh, again, use our hashtag Boss22 uh, in order to join the conversation online. And with that, um, it's a pleasure to it's, it's not our last speaker today, because we got someone who's coming after you, but um, our officially planned last speaker is Vanessa Miller from Point8. You'll be talking about key points and lessons learned in AI projects and mechanical engineering. You're studied at TU Dortmund. You completed your doctorate in 2019 in the field of experimental partial physics, and you'll be talking about your lessons learned in AI projects. So thanks for joining us today and sharing your insights. Stage is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you, Bitcom, for the nice invitation and the very nicely organized um, summit. And thanks, Kim, for the nice introduction. Um, so just uh, shortly, who, who am I? Um, I'm a physicist. Um, I've studied at TU Dortmund and um, in experimental particle physics. So what did I do? So I analyzed data from the LHCB experiment. Um, that is one of the larger experiments at the Large Hadron Collider um, at CERN in Geneva. And what I tried to answer was um, why at the beginning of the universe, so at the Big Bang, antimatter and matter are produced at the same amount and they annihilate each other. Why are we now living in a matter-dominated universe? So what happened there? And um, I basically measured a property of a, of a triangle very well um, with a lot of math and statistics and also um, machine learning, but just in very specific uh, use cases. So for example, um, filtering out the signal and getting rid of the background. Um, yeah, so what do I do after, um, yeah, um, science and research and um, with experience in machine learning and data science. Um, there were not a lot of options in the rural area in, in Dortmund um, in 2018. Um, so I knew some guys from uni that um, founded a company named Point8. Um, I joined as a freelancer um, during my PhD and then as a full-time employee as a data scientist in 2018. Um, so what are we doing at Point8? We are a data science company, um, and we uh, usually do data science for, for industry, so not, no, not financial or, or um, um, banking or, or, or insurance stuff, but um, yeah, very um, close to, to um, mechanical engineering. Um, we are now 20 data scientists, and we do everything from data analysis, data engineering, um, machine learning, AI, and simulations. Um, we are now six years old. Um, and um, yeah, our use cases are from consulting to prototyping and implementation in the end. Um, here are some references from ours so that I am allowed to talk about. Uh, mostly medium-sized German uh, companies um, from the industry. Uh, some of them are hidden champions in their own field. And um, the, the use cases are as various as our customers. So, the buzzwords, predictive quality, predictive uh, maintenance, or smart devices come up very often. Um, but we really do um, customizable solutions um, for our customers. Um, to give you a quick overview of our tech stack, so what are the tools uh, we use um, at the moment? So we, we are mostly uh, in the area of open source and uh, in the uh, Python ecosystem um, for, the, for the data science stuff. Um, we also, um, yeah, do IT and DevOps in GitLab or, or um, in uh, Azure or on the Google Cloud. Um, we have a, like a small project um, with hardware, so we, we also um, develop hard hardware to, to help the customers get very high frequent data out of the machine control system, which is kind of a, a pain. Um, but um, yeah, we help them there as well and um, do some, some, some development there. Um, yeah, so coming to um, our first uh, use case um, is uh, a use case we, uh, we, uh, we did with Rital. So this is also a German medium-sized company. They produce and um, so design and construct um, control cabinets for, for machines and also almost everything in the periphery. So 
um, especially cooling um, aggregates. And um, they recorded a lot of data and uh, the experts at, at Rittal weren't uh, really sure if there's added value in this data. So there was a lot of it, temperatures, viscosities, um, velocities and stuff like that. And so we tried to answer the questions, um, what potential lies in the data and which use cases make really sense with this. Um, so quick disclaimer, we aren't allowed to show you real data. So this is simulated data, but this is really close to the, to the real life data we got. So um, yeah. We got a lot of it, and you see here two parameters, um, value A and value B from the machine, and what you see is a lot of chaos. So there was not, of, not a, lot of, a lot to see um, from the beginning. Um, so hmm, it, it was also the, the case for almost all of the other parameters and recorded values. So what we did was we um, got all experts um, at one table, so all stakeholders at, at Rital, and um, with our data science know-how, their domain knowledge and machine and control know-how, and also our background in physics, um, we were able to uh, identify other important um, values in, in, in the recorded data. Um, for example, here, values uh, C and uh, D. And um, also with um, everyone, we were able to uh, then identify um, stable states in this data. And um, we were then also um, able to uh, derive um, new variables and um, clean the data further for um, the analysis and then the use case. So when we uh, do all these adjustments, we get from this very chaotic picture to this one. So we now see a very clear um, correlation between value A and value B. Uh, and then what we did, okay, hmm, what, what is a a use case that is possible with that and what is the pain point of the customer and it's as you would think it was um, predictive maintenance. So um, we did um, targeted laboratory experiments and we found out that the uh, correlation between value A and value B differs for various um, for, for different uh, amounts of wear in the system. So that is what you can see here on the on the right hand side. And um, then it was quite obvious to um, train a classification model um, that was a support vector machine here that you can see in the background as the, as the layers behind it. And um, yeah, so this model is, is now running at the customer and um, can predict um, where in the system and is used for predictive maintenance um, and is rolled out um, at the moment. Yeah, so this was the first uh, use case. Um, let's switch to the second one. Um, I brought with me. So um, this is a use case we were able to um, to finish with uh, Windmüller and Hölscher. This is also a medium-sized company. They produce really huge machines um, for um, film extrusion, and um, these machines are like three stories high, and um, they uh, melt plastic here at the bottom, and then they um, cool it down by um, blowing air from the bottom of it, and then it needs to be cooled, and then it is wound up on a shaft um, at the very top of it, and so it's really big, and um, a lot of um, various parameters um, that go in there, for example, the material mix, um, additives, pressure, velocities, um, temperatures, of course, and um, the, the challenge here is a lot of parameters need to be set, and uh, it is not very obvious um, how to set these parameters so that the, the process is efficient and the quality is acceptable in the end. Um, so we uh, try to answer the question, how can the user be ideally supported in production uh, to increase quality and reduce waste in the end? Um, yeah, so as I said, a lot of parameters, a lot of influences, and um, setting the stable um, production process requires a lot of um, experience and uh, intuition by the uh, machine operators. And um, as some of the speakers before me uh, said, yeah, they're going <laughs> to retire uh, not, not far from now. And um, so uh, new people need to be trained or this needs to be uh, outsourced into uh, some kind of a digital assistance system. And um, yeah, so as there is a lot of intuition in it and experience in it, you can, you can, uh, you can assume that uh, the setting um, of the parameters is, is quite different if you use different operators, although it is maybe the same pro product um, that they are um, producing. So um, there's no um, obviously perfect setting for a product. And uh, you have a very um, vast diversity of products um, at, the customer of at the customers of Windmüller and Hölscher. 
So um, the first uh, key point uh, that we, uh, or the first um, problem that we uh, tried to solve was, okay, we ha now have to um, identify um, similar products. Um, and um, due to the extreme variety of material and production parameters, it was quite, quite challenging. But um, what we did in the end uh, with a lot of um, exploration and um, a lot of um, visualization and talking to the customer, um, we then used uh, an unsupervised learning system um, that was a clustering algorithm and um, fuzzy matching um, to find these um, similar products in the end. And then um, all of this came together into a digital assistance system, um, which uh, made um, the parameter setting more, more easier and um, thus reduces waste in the end because you don't um, you, you are producing it correctly and you don't have to throw it away if it's not uh, the quality that you want. And um, this was quite um, quite cool because this this whole project from the POC until the, the productive solution in the end that's running now um, in the cloud by Windmüller and Hölscher was done in one year. And it was so successful because we as data scientists and on the other hand, the, the mechanical engineers and uh, the UI and UX experts and the software de developers on, on Windmüller and Hölscher had really technical um, meetings almost every week. And um, it was kind of a very nicely um, work environment and quite open. So. Yeah, it was really successful. Um, so what did we learn from, from these uh, use cases and from the other ones that we are um, doing? Um, communication is key, as I said. Um, in usually, when we, get, when we come to a customer, it is uh, us on the one side and the engineers, the, so the mechanical engineers on the other side. And you have experts on both sides, and um, they have a language. And um, at the beginning, it is like, okay, um, um, you mean, for example, the same thing? No. <laughs> Sorry, I'm lost a bit. No, um, it, it, it can be the situation that um, you mean the same thing, but you, you, you don't actually uh, know what, what the other person is talking about. So. Um, that we, we, we take this uh, as a ch uh, this challenge as an opportunity, and we um, yeah do a lot of meetings. For example, I gave a training in uh, Python and Jupyter notebooks for for one of our customers, so that they understand how we think and how we work. And on the other hand, um, I got an introduction in. Uh, machine operating, which was quite cool. And so I know um, their vocabulary. And in the end, um, we can talk about um, everything together and um, yeah, develop new use cases and um, speak the same language. So communication is key. Another one is um, the interdisciplinary team. Um, so make use of it. Um, as you all know, um, Part, part of a, a data-driven use case is uh, software design, statistics, and uh, domain knowledge. And um, I, as a physicist, have some domain knowledge of uh, mechanical engineering. But um, yeah, of course, not, not every data scientist uh, in the in the industry or has this uh, um, kind of knowledge. So um, you have to have an interdisciplinary team that um, combines all of this together. And um, it doesn't have to be your team, but um, if you have like qualified um, partners on the other side of your customer, that's also very valuable. And um, thirdly, so start small and fail fast if necessary. Um, the old waterfall um, planning and management and pro 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 project management doesn't, doesn't work really well. So you have like always um, um, changing um, um, circumstances, um, not always an internet connection, not always is the data available. So um, you have to be um, agile and um, if you call it scrum or whatever, but you have to uh, do it iteratively and start small um, and harvest the low hanging fruits. Um, so as people yesterday said on the panel, um, don't go directly to the moonshot project. Just try to, to, to get acceptance in your team, in your, in your company and um, Use this um, as a as a as a first basement bay baseline, and then uh, go further and um, go iteratively uh, through your um, use cases. And um, last but not least, uh, no black boxes. So keep control of your data and understand it. So validate your models. Um, 
and uh, not just uh, trust in one number that says, yeah, your, your, your project and your, um, your uh, money will go through the roof. So there's no real um, IoT, big data, magic, want AI tool that will solve um, all of the industry's problems. So I haven't heard of it yet. So um, it must be like um, customizable um, solutions at, at, at the moment. Um, yeah, so um, all of this um, helped us in shaping uh, point eight to the company that we are today. So when it was founded, we wanted to create a nerd friendly uh, environment for all the, the people that um, come from, the, from CERN or from the Max Planck Institute and so on. Um, we want to focus um, on interesting challenges um, rather than replicate stuff um, from one customer to another customer. And um, so it's not boring. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, we value our scientific heritage. And um, this is also a part of our way of working right now. And um, a colleague of mine uh, coined the term no bullshit as core principle for our way of working. Um, yeah, thank you um, for your attention. <laughs>